Welcome to Campus Conversations, a podcast where we'll bring on guests to talk about how local, national, or global events or topics may affect our University of Nebraska-Lincoln campus. My name is Zach Wenley, one of the assistant news editors for the Daily Nebraskan, and thank you for joining me for this episode of Campus Conversations. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Campus Conversations. Today, I'm joined with University of Nebraska President Ted Carter and University of Nebraska Lincoln Chancellor Ronnie Green. Chancellor Green, President Carter, how are you both doing today? I'm doing fine. Thanks, thanks, Zach. Uh, doing great. Great to see you, Zach. And of course, as we are returning to campus, there are many different things amid the coronavirus pandemic this year. Just to get off right off the gate here, how have things sort of shifted both at the system level and at the individual UNL campus level to prepare students both for safety and that return to campus? Well, I'll try to hit the system level first. Uh, you know, since uh, we were at uh, what I would say the, the midst of the pandemic, uh, somewhere around uh, mid-April, uh, not knowing everything that we could know, uh, we made a, a lot of significant plans and one of which was to uh, do all that we could to understand the virus and make the best plans for how we could have an in-person session coming this fall. Uh, and I'm very proud of the leadership that we've seen on all the campuses, the level of work that's been done to be prepared to bring our students back for the fall session and to de-densify our campuses, make COVID-19 testing available, make the classroom safe, and even maybe more important than all that, accommodate all, uh, because not this is not a one-size-fits-all uh, type of program. For, so those that are maybe older or had other uh, uh, medical issues to not put them at risk to also offer options for our students to be either partially or even fully remote if that was their decision. So I think we've done a great job in preparation and now we're ready for the execution. So I, I, I'd offer over to uh, Chancellor Green for what, what he's doing specifically at UNL. Well, as, as President Carter said, you know, when we started into COVID-19 back in March, uh, we all remember it really well as it began to influence our daily lives in March. We, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to adapt to remote learning, right? So we were focused through that rest of the spring semester on being as successful as we possibly could make the conditions for our students to be able to progress and toward their educational goals. We knew we had our second largest graduating class ever coming up in May, uh, which we're really proud of to have completed. Uh, so we, we focused a lot in that time period on, on focusing on get, getting that remote semester completed. Um, and we're very proud of what happened through that period of time that that happened and happened as successfully as possible. And as President Carter said, we began shifting as we realized that the opportunity was going to be there for our students to re-engage in person as much as possible. We hope for a full uh, fall academic term. We shifted our focus not only to the summer and expanding the summer and expanding the opportunities in the summer remotely. As you know, that we're just finishing. Graduation is, is just finished here. Um, to how could we deliver that experience that's so important for students to be able to have as much as possible in person in the fall. So the, the curricular development, the adaptation of classroom space, the adaptation of delivery methodology, to be able to do that while accommodating, as President Carter said, the safety of both our faculty and our graduate students in delivery, as well as our, our students in the classes, um, became our focus. And I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of what we've been able to accomplish there. Uh, we, we've uh, re-equipped 490 of our classrooms to make sure they are Zoom ready. Uh, and that's being in the process of being completed now. Um, we have laid out distancing to, to be careful to the two important numbers of six and 15, of six foot social distancing and 15 minutes in close proximity if you're not socially distanced, um, providing the greatest opportunity for the, the spread of COVID-19, um, along with um, face mask and face uh, facial covering policies. All of that's ready and we're, we're in great shape to, uh, to start that fall semester. So. Uh, Lots of adaptation, 
Zach, and I'm, I'm proud of us being able to, as I saw today, coming up the street, see campus coming alive again with our students and, uh, and their families, many of them bringing them back. Definitely. And for almost five months now, the UNL campus and all of the NU system has been remote, has been online. We've, of course, reopened some facilities on campus slowly and gradually. But in April, each of you made a commitment about a month after the campuses shifted to remote to this commitment to in-person learning well before we were even thinking about the fall semester. And now that is becoming a reality. What does that mean to each of you that that is becoming a reality and to have that commitment so early on? Well, for me, and I've been very public about saying this, uh, uh, the importance of having uh, in-person, uh, on-campus uh, education, it's really more than just about the academics. You know, we can do the academic delivery remotely, whether it be synchronously or asynchronously, but the college experience is really much more than just the delivery of academics. Uh, it's really the whole person education. Uh, the college experience today, and especially here, uh, at Lincoln, it's it's about the social, the emotional, uh, and even the, the physical aspects of growth uh, for every individual student. So we are proud that we're able to continue doing that, even you know in a global pandemic that we're spending an incredible amount of time doing risk mitigation, so that we can make our students feel safe and their families safe. Yeah, exactly. I I think uh, in addition to what Ted said it very, very well, the importance of personal interaction, both, both academically and so much as we can in the, in the traditional sense, but also I always tell students, I always emphasize to students that not to take anything away from our faculty, not to take anything away from our academic discipline, but we also know that you learn equally from each other. That, you, that that's extremely important. I can't tell you how much that was important to me as a, as a college student. So, so that preserving as much of that as you can under a global pandemic is just critically, I think, critically important for the, the value of that education. Fully realizing that we're in a global pandemic and it's not going to be, you know, you know uh, uh, it's not gonna be August of 2019. Mm -hmm in the way that we think about the fall semester and the commitment that we're each going to have to have in order to deliver that safely and to protect each other and to protect our community and our folks, our, all of our folks around us. So I see that uh, collectively um, and, uh, and it's so important for that, that social structure to be part of the equation here um, in moving forward. And Chancellor Green and Ted Carter and President Carter, you each mentioned the connectedness that we learn from each other and grow from one another. What is being done, Chancellor Green, to ensure that Huskers are connected, they care for each other, and follow these health guidelines? Yeah, well, well, obviously we're trying to retain as much of that 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 physical connection as we can, while while providing the distance and providing the the safety and health practice that's in place. Uh, but, you know, we will continue to have all kinds of ways that we connect our students, even with that continued virtual piece where we need to interweave that into our, our daily interactions with one another. Um, we are trying to preserve as much group interaction through all kinds of ways on campus as we can safely and provide those opportunities for our students as well, including cur curricularly and extracurricularly, as you, as you know. Um, and then we're, we're preserving the opportunity for us all to commit to one another, right? To be able to do that together. The Cornhusker commitment that so many have stepped up and, uh, and committed to, the principles of how we're going to safely interact with one another and how we're going to protect one another through our distancing and through our use of personal protective equipment, our care for ourselves and our attention to if we personally have any impacts of COVID-19 and what happens if we do, um, all of that you know, ties into this, this interaction uh, piece. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. No, I, uh, I, I just applaud uh, the effort that you've gone through and uh, I'm excited for the fall.
of course. And we know the coronavirus, it's still here. There are still health guidelines that we need to follow and everything there. But how long has UNL and the NU system been studying and preparing for the coronavirus? Well, I still remember the first briefing that I got, got on it uh, at the end of January. And of course, it was not something that was here in the United States. It was something that was being looked at overseas in China. Uh, we had no idea that it would actually come here. And then as you know, the end of February, it started to appear that this is something we we're going to have to deal with. And as Chancellor Green mentioned, March was a critical time for us when we realized that this, this, this was really going to happen. We had very little data. We had very little understanding of the transmissibility of it and the infectious rate associated with it. But uh, again, I'm proud of what we actually did do in terms of actions to go to remote education, to do everything we could to minimize that spread, take care of our students, um, take care of them financially too. I mean, even though uh, you know they had to go to a different mode of getting their you know their their spring semester and their graduations remotely as difficult as it was. They, they really got the whole education package and we took care of the finances where we felt it was uh, appropriate for them. And then we've gotten smarter about the virus as we've gone on. I mean, it's still around with us. Uh, I think because we've gotten so much smarter and how we can deal with it and how we minimize that transmissibility, you know, this is our opportunity to be able to do this because, you know, COVID-19 is not going to go away. There might be a vaccine at the end of the year or next year, uh, even that will not be the solution 100% across the board. So, you know, we've got to learn to be able to live uh, in this world and do the things that are important to us. At the top of that list for us here is education. And how has planning changed over time? And Chancellor Green, if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I, Zach, I think uh, Ted said it well. I mean, we we've been involved in trying to learn about and understand sort of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 and the transmission of it for a pretty short period of time when you think about it. I mean, it was a very long period of time when you think about it in other ways, right? It feels like it's been a, a very long time. But it, you know, when it first started surfacing uh, in other parts of the world late last year and into January, and then when we began to see it, unfold in ways that touched the U.S. here, as Ted said, in late January, early February timeframe. Um, of course, our Med Center was deeply involved in those first, those first steps and has been deeply involved so much of the way through our, our increased learning and understanding of COVID-19. Um, that, that was, uh, everything was unknown, right? We, we didn't know what this virus was. We didn't know how the conditions of its transmission, what its effects were, how what treatment regimens were. It escalated very fast, as we remember. By the time it hit us in mid-March here, you know, at least in terms of how we operate and think it hit us in mid-March, uh, we'd already been working for weeks talking about our students abroad and the students who were studying abroad around the world and protecting their safety and getting them back to the U.S. And, and thinking about how we were going to pivot to move forward. We know a lot more, as Ted said, than we did in March, in February and March. We still have a lot to learn about this virus and about the transmission of the virus. But what we do know now that we didn't understand as well is the things we can do to mitigate it and the things that we can do to safely move into, back into our, our, our lives. Right, and um, and that's 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 a good point to be at, knowing that we are going to live through the challenges until we have better protection in some period of time ahead. So uh, we we certainly adapted and learned a lot, and it's good to be at a point where we can begin really to implement those practices in the right way. Definitely, and in that pivot and in that action that each of you mentioned, there have been some tough decisions, whether it's the NU system-wide $43 million in budget cuts or other position cutting or things like that. What are some ways that both of you have approached tough decisions that have had to be, ma had to be made during this time? Well, I, I think I would first of all say that during this critical time, I mean, a global pandemic, a pandemic that's highlighting a, a racial unrest and injustice and then an economic uh, pandemic that's tied not disconnected to those other two, uh, 
we've had to make decisions based on sometimes imperfect information. Uh, we've had to make decisions in which we can't sit around and wait and study the problem to get to a perfect solution. Um, so we've had to have very clear eyes, a lot of collaborative work. I've done uh, as much empowering to the chancellors and to our other leadership teams uh, to be able to make decisions that best fit their campus without giving them a one size fits all. Uh, I'll just tell you on the, the financial side, uh, part of the, the logic there was to lead by example. We took the first, and I would say by percentage, the largest cut here at Barner Hall. We cut 10% of our staff here, about $1.6 million over three years. Uh, and I think all the chancellors are looking at, first looking at administration in terms of where we can make those, some of those hard decisions first before we get into programs, people, or faculty. At the end of the day, trying to make sure we support our most precious asset, our students, but also looking at where we can be most efficient. Sometimes the, the cost savings aren't immediate there, but things like our one IT system definitely have saved us money. Looking at our, our capital building projects and how we do restoration on our existing structures, and even looking now down the road at contracting and how we might be able to do better contracting across the system. So we, we've had to move pretty quickly. Maybe the crisis has forced us to think more clearly and more quickly than we might have had we not had it. Um, but you know, I'm very proud again of the team that we have and the tough decisions we've had to make. As we, at the end of this, I do believe we're gonna still come out of this stronger. Yeah, Zach, we, yeah, we uh, certainly, as Ted said, have had to operate with imperfect information. We've been you know, learning and had to, be, had to make decisions based on imperfect information and the best information that we have had. We've always done that, as he said, with safety first and foremost in mind, with attention to the needs of our students and focus on our mission, first and foremost in mind, how do we deliver on our mission as the land grant university for the state of Nebraska um, in, a, in ensuring that we can provide as much opportunity for our students to succeed as possible, uh, as well as our research mission and our engagement mission with the state. And we've really tried, we've attempted very hard to not lose the focus on that mission in each of these decision steps and adjustments and pivots and pullbacks and push forwards that we've really had to make um, in all the right ways. And, and budgetarily, uh, no doubt, there is, as Ted said, this is also an economic pandemic and it has long lasting implications, many of which we are, we are experiencing today. Um, and we've had to think again with those same objectives. How will this impact our ability and our focus on our mission, preserving our academic programs at their highest level of quality is first and foremost in our decision making on every step. Uh, we're in the process, the very front end of a process uh, with our uh, projections for this next year uh, ahead of implementing some $38 million in, in budget adjustments for uh, UNL broadly. Um, and I'm very, I'm very proud and pleased, while I'm un, unhappy about having to do that, I'm very proud and pleased of the, the diligence that we have used to protect our academic enterprise and protect our people in moving forward to still deliver and to focus on that mission. So as we see that unfold, and you'll be hearing about that because we're going to be discussing it a fair amount over the next few months as we bet our way through that process and think about those those decisions and their implementation. Um, that's been our focus, is coming out of this, as Ted said, stronger on the other end, even with the challenges that we, that we have. And of course, we've mentioned the planning that has gotten us to return to campus. What about what is being done while students are on campus during this return about testing, contract chasing, and should the situation change on campus regarding information about the coronavirus or anything else? What is being done to keep students safe, communicated with, and basically well informed? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, and I'm, Ted may want to add relative to our campus partners, and I know they're they're working in the same same vein. Um, we put process and mechanisms in place, not only on the prevention side, all of the protective mechanisms and process of protection of all of our individuals. But in the event 
that one of our community members contracts COVID-19 and it's, it has an infection with COVID-19 and that diagnosis we have free testing now available to our campus that stood up and beginning to operate as we speak uh, for uh, folks who want to and need, feel the need to have a test, to have that availability and be, uh, be tested. Um, if we have a diagnosis, whether it's a clearly defined process jointly with the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department that we've worked hand in hand with throughout all of this uh, global pandemic um, for identification and contact tracing for that individual confidentially with them, so realizing these are health data uh, so that we can protect our whole community around that. Quarantining and having mechanisms for quarantining available for any student that will, uh, that if that happens, uh, we have that in Piper Hall set aside and mechanisms for that to be in place and to be, be uh, serviced appropriately for our students. So I, I think we are as prepared as possible to have all of that, uh, that, that other side if we do have infection of COVID-19 to protect and bring those, those students back to health and protect others they may have been in contact with. Same on faculty, same, same on staff um, for the campus. Uh, the, one, the other thing that it, this isn't exactly related to that, Zach, but I didn't mention it earlier and it's probably mm -hmm. important to understand, is another key component of being able to move forward successfully is our campus won't be as, as uh, densified, I'll call it, as normal. We still have a lot of our employees who are able to work remotely successfully and deliver on that mission in a remote way. So by, by having fewer people on campus at any given time, we're able to distance you know, more, uh, more appropriately and easier. Mm -hmm. So we, we also, you know, students will notice that, not in a, not in a way that will, will hinder us or hold us back, but in a way that helps us also to, to uh, deliver a safe environment for all. I think what I'd add to all that is, uh, you know, from a system perspective, uh, we wanted to make sure not only that we had the policy and the procedures lined up and, the, you know, the, the, the opening, playbook that came from our professionals at the UNMC, but we also want to make sure we have the right resources spread out across all of our campuses for testing using Test Nebraska, personal protective equipment, uh, as well as all of the other, I mean, as you can imagine, there's millions of dollars in resources needed to, to, to fight this thing and make sure that we've done all the prep. So we've done an awful lot of work working with the governor, working with the legislature, making sure that the money that came through the CARES Act through the state was a mail made available to our campus and we've been very successful in obtaining that. And Zach, I didn't mention I'm sitting by myself today, so I'm don't I'm maskless, uh, so to speak. I just got off of a meeting where I was speaking in my mask to, to the group that was on it. But uh, Ted mentioned support, uh, both in terms of physical support and supplies and you know with the two masks that each of our students are going to receive and be able to utilize through their, their experience uh, with us this fall, uh, hygiene equipment, disinfectant supplies, sanitation equipment. I'm so proud of what happened at Innovation Campus this summer where our engineering faculty together with our food science faculty at the Food Innovation Center worked with the Nebraska ethanol industry to develop a mechanism to produce mass quantities of hand sanitizer. I just read a note today from the Under Secretary of Agriculture, Mindy Brashears, who oversees all of the food safety and inspection service for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, thanking us immensely for providing them that support. They supplied all of the food safety inspectors around the U.S. with that uh, hand sanitizer. So as you our students are on campus, they're seeing hand sanitizer stations everywhere that are dispensing that important piece for us uh, adequately. Uh, the COVID-19 app that was developed at UNO uh, was, and UNMC uh, as a pre-screening mechanism for students to keep, keep attached to them, available for all of our students as another protective mechanism. So, so all of that resource support is critically important like Ted pointed out, we've had great partners and great help to do that, um, both from the university and from the state and uh, other partners as well. 
And though the coronavirus is on most of our minds at this time now, this summer also saw a renewed emphasis on Black Lives Matter following the death of George Floyd. So what is being done NU-wide and at UNL to ensure that diversity and to ensure that Black Lives Matter as the movement shows? Well, I'll, I'll give you the, the system-wide perspective. And uh, we, I think both Chancellor Green and I have been uh, upfront and talking about that uh, uh, right immediately after those events happened. Uh, we have been empathetic and listening and uh, engaging uh, with all of the elements uh, of our campuses, with our students, with our faculty, with our staff, to make sure we understand perspective. Uh, many of us don't have the life experience to be able to feel the same things that uh, certain cohorts of people might feel. And uh, I think it's important for us to have an understanding of that. I will share that uh, it's an important part of our five-year strategy to address this uh, and, and to state right up front and, and to not only make sure that we're understanding how we're going to move, but where we should have the right bias for action. You know, as we went through this just a few years ago, if you go back and review, there was a lot of discussion. Maybe we do, didn't do as much as we said we thought we might and we shouldn't make those same mistakes again. Uh, you know, if we're gonna see social change and really make um, some impact on the racial injustices that we have observed, uh, we have to take that responsibility and even as, our, as leaders hold ourselves accountable for how we're gonna get after some of that. So uh, I'm proud of what I've seen come out of Chancellor Green and some of our other uh, chancellors. And uh, you know, there's a lot of work still to be done. Well, Zach, I'll just, the only thing I'll add is Ted said it very, very well. I mean, we've been empathetic to listen really carefully. This is an important time to listen and to hear the experiences of others that we don't understand perhaps or experience in the same way. While we may feel we do that on a regular basis and feel like we have done that, we've had tremendous conversation, as you know, about diversity and inclusive excellence. And, and enhancing our, our efforts through the university in that way for some time. This is a particularly important time to listen and to listen really carefully. And as we've done that, um, it, was, it was just very clear to us that it's important for UNL to look at this as a, as a journey to understand uh, anti-racism, and racial equity or inequities where they may exist, uh, both educationally as well as in our in our own system and our own practices, and, in our, and identify and root out anywhere where we might have inherent bias that we don't recognize or that we might have. So, so we're very early in that, as you know. Uh, we have six faculty and staff co-leads who have stepped up to a leadership role in working directly with the university in framing that journey. Uh, we've had great initial conversations in that way um, that we'll see unfolding. So uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm not excited about the motivation for it, but I'm excited about the fact that, that we're gonna really look hard at this um, and uh, look inside ourselves in this one. Of course, and to close out today, President Carter and Chancellor Green, what would be your overall message, President Carter, to the NU community and Chancellor Green to the UNL community as we are returning to school? Well, my message is very simple. Welcome back. It'll be great to see students on our campus and I'm excited about uh, watching their growth and maturation and excited to see them do well. I don't think I can say it a lot better than that. What uh, Ted just said, you heard what I said earlier. I am just giddy with excitement. I guess I, I can't describe it any other way because I am. I've been looking forward to August 17th for a long time and even more to August 24th uh, when our students will be in person or in that model of in-person environment. Um, it, it is so important that we, we learn together. It is so important, as we said earlier, that we learn together. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to a great semester ahead um, for our students and for our faculty and our staff, and uh, one that I'm sure we'll remember for the rest of our lives. And I'm looking forward to a, a really successful learning environment at UNL in the, in the semester ahead. Well, President Carter and Chancellor Green, 
Thank you both very much for your time today. And to those of you tuning in, if you have any ideas for what guests or topics you would like to see on this podcast, be sure to stay up to date with your social with our social media platforms, but also feel free to comment below on this video or contact us directly at news at dailynebraskan.com. Until next time, thank you all for listening and be sure to join us for the next Campus Conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Zach.